the Srimad Bhagavatam this evening. A story that has been read, discussed, contemplated for thousands of years among sages and rishis and yogis. It is a historical event that took long took place long ago. But the lessons, the message is very much relevant to every day and every moment of our lives. How many of you endure setbacks in your life? You don't have to raise your hand. Mamo Petya Punar Janmatu Kalayama Shashvata Napnabanti Mahatmana Samsadim Paramam Gata the Bhagavad Gita tells that when we understand what is the real goal of life, then in any situation that we're in, we could make progress. Dukalaya Mashashwata means in this world, whoever we are, whatever we achieve, whatever species of life we're in, whatever social status, nationality, Tukalaya Mashashwata. There will be miseries simply because everything is changing. No matter how much we want to keep things the way they are, by the power of time, things change. If we get something we really like, we try to hold on to it, but ultimately we can't. That's material life. The Vedic scriptures describe there are three categories of ways in which we have distress. Adhyatmaka, <coughs> distress caused by our own body and mind disease, injuries, anxiety, insecurity, depression. Unfulfilled longings. Adi Bhotika is raised caused by other living beings. Mosquitoes cockroaches, <laughs> in some places snakes, but my experience is it's quite easy to tolerate them, but other humans. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's dictators or governments that suppress and oppress, there's bigots and racists and there's people who hate and there's, there's loved ones who betray us, break our hearts. And there is just people who don't act the way we, exp the way we want them to act. And that could cause tremendous frustration. That's Adi Bhotika. Misery is caused by other living beings. And Adi Daivaka Misery is caused by natural disturbances. Too much heat, too much cold, drought, forest fires, earthquakes. Recently there was an earthquake in Italy. And I, I saw that it took place close to Perugia. 
And almost every year I go to that area of Perugia. It's in the province of Umbria. That's where St. Francis of Assisi was born and raised and he lived in San Chiara, Clare. And I have good friends that live there. So when I heard about the earthquake, I called one of my friends and I asked him how he was and how was his family. And he told me that not too far from his house, the earthquake um, caused so many buildings to crumble. And in earthquakes, damage is usually when you're in a place and the, and the house, a structure crumbles and falls on top of you. That's where usually death and um, suffering is. You know, we've, our Bhaktivedanta Hospital in Mumbai have been to earthquake in Latour and in Gujarat, what was the name of that place? And Puj and in Nepal and you know they saw tens and thousands of people dead and far more who lost relatives, loved ones, homes, businesses. So earthquakes are devastating. So I asked him how he was and how was his family. And my friend, he said, by God's grace, our, fam our house has a very strong foundation. And because of that, although it shook, there was no damage to the home or to any people. He said, most of the places that are not right under the epicenter, if they don't have strong foundations, they crumble. If they have strong foundations, they stand. I was thinking that's the way life is. In so many ways there's kind of earthquakes in our life that shake us. Nobody sees with their eyes a foundation. But if we have a strong spiritual foundation, if we experience the peace, the happiness, the love within us, which is actually eternal, beyond all the ever-changing situations of this world. And we're not, the quality of our life is not affected by these inevitable earthquakes that come. The story we're speaking of today is about an incredible elephant. I can tell so many stories about elephants, actually. They're really interesting people. <laughs> but this particular elephant, he lived long ago. He was the most popular, powerful, person in the entire jungle where he resided. And where he resided was close to a mountain called Trikuta, which is described in great detail in the Vedas. It's a heavenly abode. There are graphic descriptions in the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas about the beauty of Trikuta. Incredible, beautiful trees with flowers and fruits and so many auspicious birds <coughs> singing and warbling. Temperature so nice. It's paradise. Gajendra was the most powerful being. Therefore, he was like the king. And the innocent little animals, like the rabbits and the deers, they just loved him because they knew nobody could 
harm them as long as he was around. And the predator animals, they loved him because he was really kind, but they were really afraid to hurt anybody. So it was really a peaceful place because of him. His physical power, his incredible influence. And he decided to take a holiday to a beautiful lake. This is like the heart of the Trikuta experience, <laughs> to go to this lake. The lake was crystal clear water, perfect, beautiful temperature. And there were so many golden lotus flowers in it. And the fish in the lake and the turtles were so happy, they would just be kind of dancing around because they were just so blissful being in that water. And as they would dance around, the lotus flowers would shake and the pollen of the lotus flowers would go into the water. And the water tasted like nectar. When the cool, heavenly breeze would blow upon the water, it would carry that a fragrance that would intoxicate everybody. It was the fragrance of the pollen of the lotus flowers. Gajendra went to that lake. It just couldn't be a better day. He went in the water and it was so nice. And he went with his, with all of his best friends, his wife and his children and his grandchildren. They were all there. And to show love for them, while he was in the water, he would bring the water into his trunk, like elephants do, and he would drink it. And he actually became intoxicated, but not like people in New York get intoxicated. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a type of intoxication that kind of makes you um, lose the connection with your true self. It was just so nice. It was so sweet. It was so wonderful. And he wanted to share that experience with all of his loved ones. So with his trunk, he would suck up and then <laughs> he would spray it upon his wife and she would <laughs> and <then laughs> he would sp spray it upon his little children and they were all dancing around. Oh, Father, we're so heavy. We're so heavy. <laughs> and his friends and everyone was just enjoying. It wasn't just the sweetness of the water and the atmosphere. It was an exchange of affection. He was giving them happiness, and their happiness was his happiness. So they were being happy, and they knew that their happiness would make him happy, and his happiness would make them happy, and their happiness would make him happy. So they were all really happy. <laughs> Suddenly, <laughs> something happened that they never expected. At the moment, at the height of their pleasure, everything was just going so well. Then <coughs> he got a feeling on his leg that was excruciatingly painful. And he looked down. There was a gigantic crocodile who had his teeth in his leg and he was squeezing really hard. That crocodile with all of his strength was trying to pull Gajendra under the water. Now, nobody could challenge Gajendra on the land. He was too strong. He was too expert. But in the water he wasn't so expert. The crocodile pulled him deeper into the water and Gajendra pulled the crocodile out of the water and then the crocodile pulled him back into the water. They were pulling back and forth and back and forth. For a really long time this fight was going on. But as the hours and the days passed, 
Gajendra was really getting tired. He was far stronger than the crocodile on the land, but he couldn't get any nourishment in water because it's not his natural place. Elephants are land animals. But the crocodile, being in the water, he was getting s so much nourishment. He was getting stronger and stronger and stronger while Gajendra was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Gajendra looked toward all his friends and his children and all his family members and all they could do was stand there and cry because there was nothing they could do to help him. They tried. They tried to pull him out. All his friends got together like with chains and tried to pull him out, but the crocodile was in the water and he was really strong. He just kept pulling him back in. And after an incredible fight for his life, he realized that he's going to die. With all his power, with all his prestige, with all his influence, with all his friends and family, nothing could help him. The crocodile was more enthusiastic and aggressive as ever. Now before we continue the story, let us analyze what is this crocodile? These crocodiles can come in many forms in our lives, even beyond our control. Not long ago, one family was telling me they want great efforts to go on this picnic they cooked all these nice things and they were looking forward to going to this place. It's a simple little story. They went on the picnic and they were all really intent to enjoy and they had good food and good music and they were all together and suddenly these ants started biting them. Really hungry ants. Have you ever been a place where those kind of ants are? And Everywhere they sat, the ants attacked. So they just packed up everything. They couldn't eat. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't even talk. They left. And these people were really wealthy, influential people, government people, and were telling me this. So they can control government affairs of entire states but they can't control the ants. <laughs> How big is the ants? They're so tiny compared to them. And I know champion athletes who've you know, worked their whole life to get strength and muscles and everything like that. And then one tiny little mosquito. How big is the bicep of a mosquito? <laughs> Well, one little mosquito bites him and he has malaria it, and the person is knocked out. He can't, he's, he's, on the, he's on his deathbed. Taking all kinds of medication just to save his life. So it's the nature of the world. One little mosquito can spoil all your plans. Or to speak of the weather. <laughs> so many situations. And the Srimad Bhagavatam explains that this crocodile especially represents time. Everyone is in the jaws of the crocodile of time. And it's pulling us down. We grow old we get diseased. And eventually, inevitably, everyone dies. Samashita ye pada palava plavam mahat padam punyigasho muradi 
Pavam budir vatsa padam 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 yadvi padam natesham. Lord Brahma offered this prayer. That truly intelligent people, they make their goal within, in the eternal shelter of the Lord. Not in a place where there's danger at every step. This material world, it is described padam padam yadvi padam natesham. There are dangers at every step. Crocodile of time. Just yesterday I was at the Omega Ecstatic Chant. And it's quite interesting because the majority of the people who attend are quite old as far as their physical um, status in life. <laughs> yeah, good size of the crowd is like around my age, in their 60s. Bhakti Center are much younger people, although some of us old guys are here, and girls. <laughs> But the people really connected because youth doesn't last. We want it to last, but it's so fleeting. When you start getting old, you can have facelifts. You can get the best types of cosmetics to cover cracks and wrinkles, but it doesn't change the reality. <laughs> that you're in a crocodile's mouth. <laughs> and it doesn't last very long. Janmam rityu jarabhyadi dukha dosanu darshanam. The Bhagavad Gita tells that the real problems of life are birth, old age, disease, and death, and all the things that happens in the process. Ahanyate hanyamane sarire. Our beloved Guru Srila Prabhupada, he explained in Sanskrit two words, deha, which means the body, the physical body and the mind, and the intelligence, and the ego, ahankar. This is deha. And then there's Dehi. That means the witness within the body, the proprietor of the body. We are Dehi. We are in the body. We are not the body. Like a car. So some people, they challenge, if you know you're not this body, then why will you take care of your body? What's the use of all this yoga practice of you know, trying to be flexible and beautiful and healthy if you're not the body? Is that a good question? I think it is. <laughs> In the bhakti school, we understand the importance of taking care of our body and mind even more if we understand its purpose. Its purpose is to serve the nature of the Atma or the living spirit, the soul within us. Let us examine the comparison of a car. You may have a different kind of car. It may be in a US made car. It may be a foreign made car. But if, it's a, if you put a lot of energy and money into your car, you're going to take nice care of it. You're going to change the oil. You're going to give it waxes and cleaning and all of that stuff. Yes? That's natural. But there's another kind of car called an ambulance. <laughs> an ambulance is a car. And that car has a serious service to help others, to save others. Now, 
How much time a day do you spend on your little car? I'm not talking about your body car. I'm talking about your Ford or Chevy or Toyota or whatever. And how much time do people take care of an ambulance? They scrutinizingly make sure every little detail of it is excellent every day. Because if anything goes wrong, it's going to likely be the cause of someone's death. So people really take care of the ambulance because it has a purpose, it has a mission. When we connect to the eternal nature of the soul and to the degree we connect, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadya Kabunoi Sravanadi Sudhichiti Kori Ayudhoi We are Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss. We are the witness of all the changes of this body and the world. And yoga is to reconnect to the soul, to harmonize the, the activities of the body and the mind with the purpose of the soul. The most essential nature of the soul, which can never be changed, is to feel Krishna or God's love and to be an instrument of that love. Karuna. Karuna is Sanskrit for compassion. Not just a thought or a feeling or a theory, but a deep concern. Karuna means active, dynamic, thoughtful compassion, where we're willing to make a difference, to enlighten others, physically, emotionally, and especially spiritually. So when we connect to our own true nature, through chanting God's names, through our prayers, then we understand our purpose is to be compassionate to others. And this body is the ambulance. It's the means by which it's the car we're given somehow or other to extend that compassion to others. So from a bhakti perspective, you know, exercise and yoga practice is not just to feel good. That's there. Because the greatest feeling is the feeling of love, compassion, and purpose. But there are so many obstacles. How, how to grow through the obstacles? That is the story of most all spiritual scriptures how to grow through obstacles. Throughout the world, throughout history, whether Bible, Quran, Ramayan, Mahabharat, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, or other such scriptures and histories, it's usually about how people respond to difficult situations. So here we find ourselves, like Gajendra, in the jaws of the crocodile, being pierced by the teeth of the crocodile. And we may not notice it at the moment, but he's there and we're there. So when Gajendra realized there's nothing, with his strength, his influence, his wealth, his family and friends could do to help him, something happened. Something he completely forgot from a previous life awakened within his mind. In his previous life, he was a king named Indrajumna. And he was actually a devotee of the Lord. He learned stotras or prayers, prayers of calling upon the Lord and Sharanagati, 
of taking shelter of the Lord. The Bhagavad Gita, there's a beautiful verse. Neha bhikramanasosti pratyavayo nevidyate svalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. That any progress we make spiritually in this life or past lives, it can never be lost. It's, it's an investment in an eternal account. It can be forgotten. When I was a little boy, I used to hear the story of a man who was told that his father left him a great treasure. And he searched the whole world seeking that treasure. And in the process, he died. And they brought him all the way back home and decided to bury him in his backyard. And as they were digging, the treasure was there. There's a lot of songs like this right in your own backyard. You can go here, there, everywhere. So what we're re lo really looking for is within our own hearts. That's where the true treasure of life is. And whatever progress we make toward that treasure, whatever spiritual advancement we make, can never be lost. But like that person looking for the treasure, we can forget it. We can forget where it is. <laughs> and when we forget, we're like a poor person. We're millionaires who don't know where our money is. <laughs> so we're living like a really poor person. We're begging for something to eat. And we can afford palaces and cooks. That's our situation. Every single one of us. We are all children of the same God. We have the inheritance of the love, the happiness, the resources of the Lord. But somehow we've forgotten our connection. So King Intajumana, he somehow or other got involved in a situation where he made a mistake. I'm not going to go into too many details. He was cursed by a sage because of his mistake. And he took his next birth as an elephant. And he was completely under the impression that I am an elephant. I am, this is me. And these children are mine. And this jungle is mine. So he was living in that illusion for a long time. He completely forgot what he had. All the wonderful realizations of his previous life. But the circumstance of being helpless about to die, where nobody could help him. He became really reflective and connected, where he remembered the prayers that he learned in his previous life. It all came back to him when his heart was open, when he tuned in. You see, as long as we're distracted, everything's foggy. He was attracted by all his power and all of his happiness, but now there was no distractions. So he began to pray to the Supreme Lord, the one God of all living beings. He humbled himself in his prayers. My dear Lord, you're the source of everything that exists. The Bhagavad Gita tells, Mayadhyakshena Prakriti Suyate Sacharacharam Hetunan Inukonteya Jagad Viparivartate. Krishna says, I'm the source of 
I'm the controller of all material existence, ultimately. Daivi yeshu gunamai, mama maya duratyaya, mame vamye papadyante, maya me tatarantite. The illusions of this world, the gunas, passion, ignorance, material goodness, very difficult to overcome. So many distractions. But if we take shelter of the Lord, we can easily cross beyond it. So he remembered that. Here he was, an elephant, remembering that if I just take shelter of the Lord, I could easily cross beyond all these difficulties. Aham sarvasya prabhavo mata sarvam pravartate iti matva bhajante mam buddha bhava saman vita Krishna tells in the Bhagavad Gita, I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this perfectly engage in my loving service and worship me with all their hearts. He was offering beautiful prayers which very much um, were in the spirit of what we're discussing from Bhagavad Gita. Through his prayers, Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam Eko Bahunam Yogadadati Kaman. He expressed that I'm completely dependent on higher power of your grace, my Lord. And the conclusion of his prayers, he didn't ask to be saved. Because even if you're saved physically, something's going to happen later, and you're going to die eventually. <laughs> so you know, getting saved on a physical or emotional level is just like a stopgap situation. The great sage Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he offered a beautiful prayer, similar to Gajendra. Maro bida ko bi jo icha to ha nitya da sa prati tua adhikar. That my Lord, I don't pray that you protect me. If you want to protect me, nothing can harm me. If you want to harm me, nothing can protect me. <laughs> It doesn't really matter whether I live, whether I die, whether it's nice, whether it's not nice. I just give my heart to you. In whatever situation comes, I'm yours. That was the mood of Gajendra. My Lord, I'm yours. Do whatever you like with me. Ashlisyavapadaratampanashtumam. I take shelter. In other words, he wasn't asking Vishnu or God for anything. He was offering his body, his mind, his words, his heart, his soul to the Lord. That's called sharanagati or surrender. And he spoke with such feeling. And that feeling is really the the culmination of all knowledge and wisdom. He prayed, my Lord, what do I have to fear? You are in my heart. You are in the heart of every living being, including this crocodile. I'm yours. The Lord descended. In his prayers, he explained the same teaching as the Gita, Paritra Naya Sadunam Vinashaya Chuduskritam Dharma Samstapanarataya Sambhavami Juge Juge. You are the one God of all living beings, and you have descended throughout history in so many forms with so many names to give shelter. 
by giving us an understanding of how to live in our present situation in such a way that we could learn to love you. We can make our, this is my words, I'm sorry, I'm intervening, make our body into an ambulance. <laughs> we're, we're really trying to help others with it and taking care of it with that understanding. So the Lord descended. He came on his carrier Garuda. He came in the form of Vishnu. Vishnu means the all-pervading, omnipresent source of everything that exists, or God. You're so beautiful. And he had a chakra called Sudarshan. And he took that Sudarshan Chakra and he released it. <laughs> like that. You know what that means? He did like a surgical operation on the mouth of the crocodile. <laughs> and the cr crocodile re released Gajendra. And at that point, because he was touched by the grace of the Lord, the crocodile assumed the form of a Gandharva, a divine being. He was actually seeing God. He became self-realized and he went to a heavenly abode. And Gajendra, he didn't want to go to any heavenly abode. He just wanted to give his heart for the service and the pleasure of his beloved Lord. So right then and there, the Lord took, Vishnu took Gajendra with him and he, he transformed into an eternal spiritual body and brought him to Vaikuntha, the spiritual world, where he attained the ultimate liberation. In the Vedas, there are different levels of liberation. There's the more temporary liberation where we take some medicine and our fever goes down. Or we you know, hear some nice music and our anxiety goes down. But eventually it comes back. But there's the liberation of Shanti, where we attain the peace of Brahman, entering into the all-pervading realm of, of, of divine light beyond this material creation. And for the bhakti yogis, the highest liberation is Vaikuntha, to enter into the home of God and in the most intimate loving relationships with the Lord eternally. Gajendra was given that liberation. As the Lord was coming and Gajendra saw him, he plucked one of the lotus flowers with his trunk because <laughs> his legs were kind of, you know, in crocodile jaws. <laughs> and he just offered, in the form of that lotus flower, he was offering his heart in love and gratitude to the Lord while he was still in the crocodile jaws. And when we do puja, when we do kirtan, it's like that. Our voice, the objects that we offer, whether it be a lamp or a flower. We're offering the lotus of our hearts, of our willingness to serve and to love. And the Lord reciprocates with each of us at every moment. In this way, Gajendra, in the truest and highest sense, he lived happily ever after. And in this, in this story, Srila Prabhupada again and again cites a beautiful verse. Tatenu kampam susumikshamano punjana evatna kritam vibhagam ritvagva purvir vatatam namaste jivetya muktipade sadayabhag. That 
that even when a devotee of the Lord is passing through the most difficult circumstances, a devotee sees it as a beautiful positive opportunity to take shelter. The more difficult, the more it, we can seriously take shelter. And one who, when difficult circumstances happen in our lives, whatever variety it may be, if we can be grateful, offer our pranams or our gratitude <coughs> to the Supreme within our hearts, then we inherit our rightful claim, which is the highest perfection of liberation in loving devotional service. I remember one of my very dear brothers was dying of cancer. In fact, he was from the Lower East Side of New York. He lived here in the 60s. His name was Hayagriva. And he was laying in his bed. He had cancer of the spine. And he was in a lot of pain. He couldn't walk, couldn't move. And I used to sit at his bedside and, and just read and tell stories to him. And I remember citing this verse that I just spoke to you. of how we all have this opportunity, even in the most difficult circumstances, to be grateful. That, Krishna, you're with me, and I'm with you, and this is really a chance for me to connect. And when I cited that verse, he started crying in happiness. He said, that's it. Whether we're on our deathbed or whether we're at the peak of enjoying life, this is it. That the real value is how we're really connecting to our own souls and to God and to other souls. And every time I met him, he just wanted to discuss that verse. It was so beautiful. The story of Gajendra is the story of hope, even in the darkest times. It's a lesson that can help to sober us what is really important in our lives and how, can, how we can reconnect to who we truly are. at the Bhakti Center, in the line of Sri Chaitanya, the simplest, most joyful and powerful way of connecting is chanting Kirtan, the beautiful names of the Lord. So now we will do Kirtan. And everybody, please be like Gajendra. <laughs> As I'm chanting, Receive Krishna in your heart because Nama Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Ras The Supreme Lord of all beings has descended within these beautiful mantras to give us that presence and that grace. And we can access it according to the gratitude of our hearts and the attention in which we receive humility and gratitude. With folded prayerful hands, we receive the holy names. And then we raise our arms like this, kind of like Gajendra raised his trunk. Gajendra raised his trunk to the sky to offer a lotus flower representing his heart. He was his soul, he was offering it to the Lord. So we raise our arms. And as we chant, we can offer our hearts to our beloved. Thank you very much.
you sound so tired. <laughs> Please stand up. <laughs> <laughs>